learn and we try to decipher what's right and true and what's best. And so, um, so that's kind of our strategy. Our lead team meets on Tuesday, and I appreciate your prayers for us as we delve into these questions. We're also looking at a budget, and we're going to have a new budget starting September 1st. So for members of the church, we're gathering on August 23rd uh, to approve the budget. You'll receive a copy of the budget and the agenda for the meeting next week, next Sunday, the 9th. And, uh, and so we um, encourage your prayers for those things. But here's the questions that we're really diving into. Two questions. First, and I would argue most important, are for those outside the church, how do we break down barriers that exist between themselves and Jesus? First Peter that we studied uh, this, uh, what was it, winter, I guess? Man, the time is confusing right now. This, this winter and spring, it said this verse. It said, live such good lives among those who are apart from Jesus, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Matthew 28, 19, Jesus just says it simply, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit pause here. Next Sunday, we have a baptism. Uh, Sasha is going to be baptized. She's over there in the blue shirt over there. Let's give her a hand. She's going to share with us next Sunday. She's going to get baptized, praying for some warm weather so the water's a little bit warmer. If it's like this, she's going to earn that baptism next Sunday. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to do that next Sunday. You want me just to use this? Um, and so the question is, how do we conduct ourselves as a church, always, but especially in COVID-19, that breaks down barriers that exist between people and Jesus? And conversely, what might we do uh, that would build barriers between people and Jesus? And so that's the question we're wrestling with, and I'd encourage you to wrestle with and pray about. The second question is this, as a church family, we are a family. And the question is, in the midst of this pandemic, how do we stay family, right? How do we stay connected? How do we stay unified? I'm really connected. I'm too much connection. Jonathan's going to get me set up here. Okay. And, and how do we just stay together as a, as a church? Uh, we know right now, and we're pretty confident as we, as we read things, that meeting outside allows for the safest worship environment, and it allows for the most people to come. And so we plan on continuing that. So you can come in your cars, you can come sit. It, it just allows for the most of us to gather. We're, we're confident of that, that if we met inside right now, we'd have a lot less people that could all come and gather as a, as a church family. Um, we're also fairly confident that it's going to get too cold at some point to keep doing this. Uh, and that's the unfortunate reality of the great state we live in. And so we're making plans for what does it look like to worship in the sanctuary. And it provides some challenges, sitting in the same space indoor for a prolonged period of time, um, sitting with, uh, in an open sanctuary with people that we, we don't necessarily know that are coming in. We, we're wrestling with all of these questions. What does children's ministry look like? How many people can be in there? How do we, how do we arrange it? Um, and what do we, do we sing or not? And, and all of these things, how does it affect the worship? How do we provide a powerful and meaningful experience? And so pray for us. We're going to be working with some of the medical professionals. Expect an email soon if you're one of those. And we're going to be putting our heads together to try to figure, to figure that out um, and, and what that looks like. Thirdly, we're going to look on some other potential plans, some other clubs that we want to have in our bag in case we need to use them. And one is to organize our church into smaller groups for two potential reasons. One, it's good just to, in order to check in with each other and, and to connect with each other, that if we're in some smaller groups and those groups are checking in, we just want to make sure that people know we care. And when things come up in your life, uh, we want to be able to, to hear those and pray for you and lift you up and encourage you. Uh, potentially, we might need to meet in smaller groups. Uh, we believe that potentially uh, more people might gather if it's a smaller group, if it's a, a number of people that you know and you know how they live their life, whether it's a, a low risk for COVID or a high risk for COVID, that if it's the same 10 or 12 people in a room, um, it, might be, uh, it might be a lot easier to walk into that room than if it's a big open room uh, full of folks that uh, you don't necessarily know where they've been or, or how they've lived their life. So we don't know if we're gonna, how much we're going to push into that plan, but we're 
we're just going to keep working on having a few clubs in our bag so then as the situation arises, we can pull it out and use it if we need it. And, and so there's some other plans that we might develop, some hybrids of these plans, and, and we're just going to have a few ready at our disposal. So pray for us as we meet Tuesday and in the coming weeks, and as we make decisions, we'll let you know uh, what the plans are. But for right now, the plan is to meet outside, and then as the weather turns cold, and soon we'll have a, a plan of this is what we're going to do first, and then we'll adjust as, uh, as the situation arises. But these are the two questions that, that for me, especially I'm wrestling with. For those outside the church, how do we break down the barriers that exist between people and Christ? And as a church family, in the midst of this, how do we stay connected and unified and together? Those, for me, are the two major questions. And so I'm thankful that we can have a, a beautiful morning to be together, and hopefully you get encouraged as you check in with some of your church family. And, uh, and I thank you for your prayers as we continue in this uh, unusual journey. Uh, at this time, we're going to hear from our uh, children's uh, minister, Renee. Renee is going to come and give us our message for our children uh, this morning. Thanks, Renee. Um, nice to see you here. I don't see all the kids that come uh, come with me on, well, it used to be Wednesday night and on Sunday morning. Um, but we have been able to meet with the kids on Thursdays now. The last two Thursdays, we meet for two hours here in the backyard. And we've been playing games, and some of the kids have been there. And it's just been a wonderful time seeing the kids again. And, and they are really good about, well, they were pretty good about sitting in the X's until it got so hot that you had to sit in the shade. But, you know, kids are kids. And I just have to trust that the Lord is going to be with us. He's going to protect us. And we are going to have a great time together. Um, today I brought some pictures that I made. And I want you kids to see if you can tell me what they are. Now, some of you are a ways away, but if, you know, if you can see them, I have my first one right here. Do you know what this is? Yes, what is it? It's a McDonald's sign. I think everyone in this whole area here knows what McDonald's looks like. And we know what's inside of McDonald's. They're not selling farm equipment. They're not selling um, linens or towels. What are they selling? They're selling hamburgers and fries. And this has not. This is not my most favorite spot anymore. Um, I went li lived through three kids going to there, and it's not one of my favorite places. But you know, my mom is 98, and this is one of her favorite places to go inside. And well, we don't go inside and eat. But she likes their fish sandwich. So once a week, we go through the drive-thru, and we get she gets her fish sandwich for the week. Now, but we know what's inside. We're pretty sure that everything that we think is in there is in there. Okay, I got another picture. See if you know what this one is. Do you know what this one is? Oh, yes. What is it? Tessa. Oh, it's Dairy Queen. They don't even hardly call it Dairy Queen. They, all, they say, let's go to the DQ. It is a Dairy Queen. Now, what's inside of the Dairy Queen? Well, I know there's ice cream in there. When I was a little girl, my dad would take us on the, in the game farm. I don't know if you know where the game farm is. It's Carlos Saber game farm. He'd take it. They used to have tons and tons of roads. And we would go riding around. And on, usually on Saturday night, we'd go. that was our big Saturday night out, was go to the game farm and go for a ride. But we would see all kinds of animals. And he'd point out all kinds of things for us. And we'd go slow. All our windows were open. And at the very end, we'd go to Forest Lake, and we would go to the Dairy Queen. And that was, and we all got an ice cream cone. That's what we got. They were 10 cents. Okay, then, now this one, I don't know if any of you kids know what this is. If you live in St. Paul in the school that I used to go to, what is it? Tell me what it is. <gasps> YMCA. Yes, they don't say why. They say the why now. And... You know what's inside of the Y? There's swimming pools. There's equipment that you can use to exercise. There's classes. There's gyms. Oh, it's all kinds of fun stuff. So when you see this, you know what's inside. Okay, I have one more. Now, I don't know if the kids know what this is. I know most of the adults probably know what this is, especially if you're younger. 
I tried use. Oh, you know what? What is it? <gasps> Twitter. Yes, it's called Twitter. And Twitter, I tried it when it kind of first came out, and I thought, this is crazy. And you can only use so many characters or so many, you know, letters and numbers and stuff. And you send little messages and you say little things. And if you're on Twitter, you've got people following you. And then you tweet stuff. And um, so when you see this, you know what it is. And I asked my mom what it was, and she said, it's a bird. I said, you're right, it's a bird. So we know all about this. Now I have another symbol. Now wouldn't it be great if every one of you would have a sign on you so we knew what you were like inside? Like, like this one. If I saw the sign on you, I would think, ah, oh, I think I might stay away. I might not ask them what the problem is. Why are they sad? Should I go help them? I don't, I'm not sure what I should do if I saw someone wearing this sign. That's what was inside of this person. They were hurting inside. These are called emojis, by the way. I know the words. How about this sign? If you had this sign on you, I would just be so happy. I'd say, oh, I'm going to go talk to them and we'll see why they're so happy. The problem is we can't put signs on us to let people know how we feel inside. Now, I have a scripture verse I want to read to you. Let's see if I can put this the right way. The scripture verse is this, Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This is what should be on our inside. This symbolizes Jesus. It symbolizes what's in our heart. It's not the heart that's beating. It's it's our mind, it's our soul, what we really think is important. And if you have this in your heart, if you have Jesus inside of you and you're following Jesus, we are supposed to let our light shine so they know what's inside of us. God said, I made you like me. Now go out and tell others about me. So that's my message for you today, kids, is I want you to let your light shine. Be kind, be gentle, be thankful. Um, help other people out. Show them that you love Jesus, and it'll shine right out, and it'll shine out to the world. Thank you. Thanks, Renee, for that word. You're the best. And we just so are appreciative for your work with our shorties. Dave, those are some nice clubs, but I don't know about those head covers. Those Nebraska head covers. Right color, though. Um, come to the time in our service where we get to pray together. And I want to share a prayer with you today from a pastor named Michelle Henricks. And she wrote a book on prayer that's really been encouraging me lately. And today's prayer that she wrote is entitled, We Claim Your Promises, and it centers on Matthew 5, which is our text for today. So would you pray with me? Lord, we gather in your presence, just as the multitudes did so many years ago on a hill in Galilee. We gather not only to hear your word to us, but also to bring the joys and concerns of our lives to you. Lord, hear our prayer. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Our spirit can be poor in so many ways. We lift up those who struggle with addiction, mental illness, physical illness, violence, oppression, and fear. Each of these tears apart what you have created, and the daily burden of carrying them attacks the very essence of who we are. We pray for freedom from these struggles for us and for those known only to you. We claim your promise that we belong to you in this life and the life to come. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. There are many things we mourn in this life. Loss due to death, to aging, losses of jobs and relationships. These losses are very real and very difficult. And we find comfort knowing that you also wept and mourned loss in your life. We claim your promise of 
a peace that surpasses all understanding. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Lord, we don't desire to inherit the things of this earth, but pray for humility and grace as we live our lives. Our inheritance comes through you, who overcame all the powers of earth and all creation so that we may be with you in both life and death. We claim your promise that we will share in your inheritance. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Jesus, you told us that when we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, then the things we need will be provided. Help us to trust in your words, knowing that when we seek you, loving mercy, acting justly, walking humbly, you will provide. Give us the courage to stand up to injustice even when we are afraid. We claim your promise that one day justice will roll down like the waters and righteousness like a stream. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. In a few moments, we will pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In teaching us this prayer, you also taught us how to be merciful. May we let go of our pride so that we may find reconciliation in our relationships. Help us to see those whom we see as other, as our brother and sister, your beloved child, the homeless, the immigrant, the violent, the foreigner. We claim your promise of mercy as we are merciful to others. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. We know the human heart is deceitful, Lord, so how will any of us see you? Help us to lay down the pride, greed, envy, anger, and lust in our hearts. Refine our intentions and, des and desires so that your will is our will. We claim your promise to make the blind see so that we may see you. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Violence seems to rule the world. We see people killing each other in our own cities and throughout the world. Lord, forgive us. We pray not only for the absence of conflict, but for true peace, where there shall be no more war. We claim your promise that people will come from the east and the west, to the north and the south, to sit and eat together at your table. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Most of us do not know about persecution, especially for righteousness' sake. May we be aware of those who suffer and even die as they stand up for justice, liberation, peace, and basic human rights. And as we gather so freely to worship you this morning, we pray safety for those who do so at the risk of prison or death. Shield them from danger as they boldly proclaim your word. Strengthen us so that we may be willing to stand up for that which we, which we know is true. We claim your promise that your kingdom is greater than all the kingdoms of this world. Risen Lord, we are, we are able to trust in your promises because you have defeated even death. Nothing can separate us from your love. As one and as your body, we claim your promises to us as we choose to live as you lived. And as we join our voices to pray the prayer that you prayed, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Chris. I'm doing announcements and stages today. Uh, for our outdoor service, uh, we need some volunteers to help, and thank, thank you everybody today that pitched in. We had a really good team. We sent out an email, but I know it can be challenging to sign up online, so if you'd like to help out with parking cars or directing cars or welcoming people, there's a whiteboard along the side of the fence where you can just write your name in with a, a physical pen and a physical paper, so if that's something you'd like to do, um, you, can, uh, you can do that after the service. 
my grandma lived three hours uh, from, my, from my house, and when I was a young child, I would get uh, car sick, so I always hated traveling and kind of dreaded the trip, coming and going. And when you came home through the rolling hills of northeast Nebraska, it just seemed like the car trip was never, ever going to end. And I knew at a certain point we were going to top a hill and we would see my sprawling town of Wayne, Nebraska. You would see all the lights. My town wasn't on a hill, but as I remember, it was kind of down in a valley. And as you got over the top of the hill, you would see all the lights of, of Wayne, a town of around 5,000 people. And it would be a welcome sight. The, cor- the torture of the car was soon to end. We were soon to be home and, and uh, back in my bed. And, and so I would just look for that hill and I'd see the lights and think, ah, oh, finally, we are almost there. Anita had a similar experience where she, uh, where she came from, from the, the south parts of the city. There's a, there's a hill in uh, Lakeville where you come over the top of the hill, and, and you see a similar sight, right? You see Minneapolis and all the lights. I always tell her that we share a similar experience, and she shakes her head and says, no, 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 we don't. I got to see Minneapolis. You got to see Wayne, Nebraska. It's way, way different. Uh, but if you've ever traveled the south part of the cities and you come over that hill, it's beautiful. You see the city, especially at night, all lit up, and, and for her, she knew that she was, she was home. In Jesus' day, there was a town called Hippos, and it was on a hill, and at night the fires would burn, and, and it was a city that everyone knew. And so when Jesus says, you're a city on a hill, they would think of this town. It was an analogy that they would know. Most of us, if we traveled far from home, however we first saw our town, you see the lights at night, and it reminds you I'm almost there. And if your home is a good and healthy and secure home, it was a really good feeling. It was always good news. Ah, there is the light of home. And so Jesus starts this sermon in Matthew chapter 5 with this news, that you are the light of the world. You, in other words, are the, are the way home. You are the good news of the world. And the, the question that we really shouldn't be asking, I think, as we live our lives is, is what is fair? What's fair? And I want to, I wanna, you know, have everything be fair. The question isn't, uh, what are my rights? What are my rights? And I want to fight for my rights. That that doesn't seem to be the question Jesus is begging us to ask. The question that Jesus seems to be begging us to ask in this uh, sermon in Matthew 5, and if you have your phones, I encourage you to pull up Matthew 5, or if you have a Bible, to to open it up to Matthew 5, because we're going to read the first part of this sermon. The question should be, we should be asking is, how can we be a welcoming light in Linwood, Minnesota? The question I think Jesus is asking us to ask is, how can we be good news? We've been going through the book of 1 John, and we finished it last week with uh, Pastor Chris's sermon. Thank you for that, Chris, in 1 John. And Jesus was answering this question, who is Jesus? That's the question that we were asking. His friends, John's friends, were being led astray by these false ideas of who Jesus was. And so in 1 John, he was setting the record straight. I walked and talked with Jesus. This is who he is. He is the Son of God, crucified, dead, buried, and risen, and now he is alive. Now we are transitioning to a different question. If Jesus is God in the flesh, as John says he is, then what did he say? What did the Son of God, when he walked on this earth, what did he say? And when Jesus spoke, the reaction he got from the crowd usually was a reaction of shock and amazement and interest and confusion. Of Like, what did you say? What what did he say? We're entitling this series, Say What? Because that was the, the reaction he got a little bit. Say what? What did you just say, Jesus? And even for me, as we read this, and I'm convinced that Jesus was actually really serious about this. This is actually how you are going to live. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to look at some of the more shocking statements that Jesus make, made and say, what was he meaning? What was he saying? And how do we actually live this out in 2020? So right now, I'm going to invite Pastor Chris up, and we're going to simply read the words of Jesus in Matthew 5. It's a little bit of a longer passage, 48 verses, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. I think a lot of it's phrased around this question, you are the light of the world. So I encourage you to just to breathe deep and follow along on your phone or your Bible or just to listen deeply, and uh, and then we're going to spend a few minutes unpacking uh, these these 48 verses, looking at uh, what Jesus uh, said. So I'm going to let Chris use this mic, and I'm going to use the one over here, so I'll pretend like I'm going to play the keyboard over here. And let's read Matthew uh, chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 1. Am I good? Tell 
me to read this one? Oh, now I can really. All right, we're good. <laughs> okay, now, now it's Matthew 5. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. Imagine that, mountainside, all the crowds sitting down, and Jesus began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Salt and light, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The fulfillment of the law. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard it said that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders it will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the, of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard, it, that, it, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Oaths. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows that you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. You have heard it that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? 
And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word of the Lord. You have heard that it was said. When Jesus said that, he was referring to the Old Testament. All of these things were found in the Old Testament, which his audience on the hillside that day would have known. And they would have known when he said, you have heard that it was said, uh, what verses Jesus was referring to. Jesus takes six life scenarios, anger, adultery, divorce, oaths, justice, enemies, from the Old Testament. He says, that we're not throwing the Old Testament out. I just want you to know that you've been interpreting the word of God wrongly. Jesus, here I am, God in the flesh. I want you to know how to understand the Old Testament correctly, God's heart correctly. Here is how God wishes that you would handle anger, adultery, divorce, oaths, justice, and enemies in a holy manner. Whenever we see holiness, we are immediately reminded of our sinfulness. Paul says one of the gifts of the law and the curse of the law is that it reminds us how far we fall short. But the law also always tempts us to do wrong. When you're driving the road and you see 55 miles an hour, most of us are tempted to be like, okay, I'll go 58. Right? We're not super tempted to go 55 usually. And, and so the law shows us where the sin is, uh, and it, it can tempt us to sin, uh, but it also reminds us deeply that we, I, am not holy. Whenever we see holiness as we read this scripture, we're reminded of our sinfulness. And I want to start by saying that that's okay. As Christians, we should be the first to admit that we are deeply broken and sinful. And there's a lot of darkness in our lives. Pastor Chris shared a few couple posts on Facebook this week. Thank you for those from Dave Ortland or Dane Ortland. And, uh, and he, it, it, they say this, nowhere else in the Bible is God described as rich in anything. The only thing he is called rich in is mercy. The only thing he's called rich in is mercy. That, that God, what he desires, David, who I'm named after, committed all kinds of sins, sins that were listed in what we just read. And David was called a man after God's own heart because of Psalm 51, uh, because he repented. And he said, I am broken. I am deeply sinful. I need forgiveness. Dave Dane, I want to say Dave because that's a cool name. Dane Ortland says, you don't need to, to unburden or collect yourself and then come to Jesus. You don't need to unburden or collect yourself and then come to church. Your very burden is what qualifies you to come. Your very burden, your sin, your guilt is what qualifies you to come. Jesus says, I am eager to forgive. But as you follow me and you become like me, this is what happens when you encounter anger. You encounter anger when you feel like something unjust or unfair has been done to you. You get out of bed in the morning and you go out in the living room and you step on Legos. You immediately become angry because you told your kids to pick them up and they didn't. And, and so then you, you have something unfair, unjust just happened to me as I started my day. And ultimately, anger can lead to murder. And so the Old Testament said, thou shalt not murder. And they said, oh, sweet, easy. Let's check that, let's check that off. But it starts in small ways. So Jesus points to the small ways. He says, ah, but think about this, name-calling. It was highly insulting in the Jewish culture as it is now. When someone's called a name, a person's identity is stripped away from them, and a new offensive identity is given to them. We've all had different names we've been called, most likely. If you haven't, you lived a charmed childhood. I'm, th I'm grateful for that. Uh, I, but I, I've had names, you've had names. My high school baseball team, one of them was Plowboy. That wasn't a good name. It was because I ran so slowly. It was like I was pulling a plow. And so, so my, my identity was, oh, that's a slow runner. And, and we've all had those, those different names that we've, that we've had. And, and, and Jesus says, no, 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 we don't, we don't do that. In our Bible, it lists the name Raka, you fool. We get the English word moron from that. You're a moron. Your identity is you're a stupid person, not that you're a beloved child of God. And Jesus says, no, 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 we don't, we don't do that. And we don't stay angry at people. That we go to great lengths to have reconciliation. That forgiveness and peace is our goal, not division and, and, and us versus them. We settle our own disputes. We don't take them to court. One author said this, unreconciled anger is the inner equivalency of murder. We do not let it fester. And when people don't let anger fester, but they get reconciled and they seek forgiveness, it's beautiful. It's 
It's attractive. It's like a city on a hill. Here's my takeaway today. Being the light of the world is extremely beautiful and extremely difficult. Being the light of the world is extremely beautiful and extremely difficult. We need God's spirit to change us. All six of these, where are you at? Anger, are you, are you dealing with it? Are you letting it go? Are, are you letting it fester? Are you replacing someone's identity with, with bad words and, and, and bad nicknames that puts a false identity on them? Or are you being the light of the world? It's extremely beautiful and extremely difficult. Adultery, Jesus says it's not only physical sexual intercourse, but also mentally engaging in acts of unfaithfulness. Showing your spouse this single-hearted devotion, working hard to show your spouse this single-hearted devotion is so unusual and so beautiful, and it's difficult. But being the light of the world is extremely beautiful and extremely difficult. Divorce is not in the plans for someone seeking to be a light on the hill. Marriage is difficult. It's challenging. Fighting to stay married. Kay was here yesterday celebrating uh, the life of her husband, married over 70 years. That's like 26,000 days. I added it up. That's a challenge, right? And Kay and Brillo seem to make it look easy, but it's not easy. And so, and so Jesus says, you've, you've got all these different exceptions. You look for a lot of exceptions for divorce. And, and the Bible says a lot of different things. And divorce is a part of a lot of our journeys. I actually printed out a paper uh, that my friend and, and uh, teacher, Klein Snodgrass, wrote on divorce and remarriage. And so if you see this, and some of it's disconcerting. There's a paper as you leave. I invite you to take it and to read it. Uh, but it's extremely beautiful, and it's extremely difficult uh, to live this way. In the ancient world, oaths were taken very seriously. And you could use a lot of things to make an oath. It was a way to prove your sincerity. We still do it. It's not taken as serious by us as it was in the ancient culture, I don't think. But, but we'll say things like you hear people say, I looked it up this week. What does it mean when people say, I swear on my mother's grave, right? We'll say that a lot. Or, or we'll, sw- we'll swear to God or we'll do different things. That, that We're trying to prove that I'm going to do this. I'm really sincere this time. And Jesus says that this happened all the time. And Jesus said, no, 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 this is simply it. Your reputation around town should be that if you say it, it will happen. That if you say it, it is true. This is the beautiful way to live. To live a life where you don't have to have something in addition to your own word. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be the, being the light of the world is extremely beautiful and extremely difficult. Eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That seems pretty gruesome. It wasn't meant to, like, if, if someone plucks my eye out, that I pluck theirs out necessarily. It was about justice, that your, your, your justice when you are hurt should be fair. And that's not our instinct. If someone knocks out one of my teeth, my instinct is to knock out four, five, six, seven of their teeth. And then they come back at me for a ten of mine, and, and then in the end it, it leads to murder, right? That's, that's really how it works. And, and so in the Old Testament, it was really a, a big step to say when someone injures you, you don't go to court or their house seeking revenge to injure them even further. You seek justice. But then Jesus says, see, here's the thing. God, God wants you to take it even, even further. I'm going to look this one up. He says, he says, you've heard it say an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth to limit revenge. But then, uh, but then Jesus says in these verses, if, so, if someone slaps you on the one cheek, just turn the other. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. That was a big deal in the ancient culture. They wouldn't have as many clothes as I have right now. They would have very few. And you'd have this shirt and you'd have a coat. And if you were poor, you used the coat as a blanket for night and it was your only garment. And Jesus says, if someone sues you, don't fight for your rights. Show them extreme generosity because that's what God has shown you when he washed you white as snow. Give him his coat as well. That's what's shocking. That's what's beautiful. That's what gets people's attention. Live this way. In the Roman world, the Romans were occupying Israel. And they could, if you were a Jewish man or woman, they could walk up to you and say, here you go. You, you got you to gotta carry my stuff for one mile. That was kind of a part of the, the, the culture. You didn't have much say in that. But you had a say in theory if they said two miles, three miles, or four miles. The idea was one. And Jesus says, when you get done with one mile, don't fight for your rights. We, we, it's, it's, it's great to have rights. It's great you only have to go one mile. But the beautiful, shocking way to live is to say, hey, sir, I'll carry it another mile. Let's keep going. That's what gets people's attention. That's what it means to be a light on a hill. 
being the light of the world is extremely beautiful and extremely difficult. And I think it's only possible if we truly believe the last sentence of our benediction we say every Sunday as a church, that nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. That I and you are a beloved daughter, son of the Most High King. And when we are treated unjustly, disrespected, when our identity is ripped away from us and a different identity is put on us, that we don't, we don't fight for that. We don't fight for our rights or who we are because we know nothing can separate me from the love of God. We just finished one mile. Let's go a few more. I'll carry your stuff, sir. That's the beautiful life. That's what a city on a hill is like. Being the light of the world is extremely beautiful and extremely difficult. And then it finishes with love your enemy. This is what a light of the world is like. You've heard it say, love your neighbor. Jesus says this is the, the highest commandment with, with after loving your God. It, but in the Old Testament, they would, they would say this, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Jesus says, nah, no, no, that's not what God wants. He wants you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is challenging, right? It's difficult, but it's beautiful. One, uh, one Christmas, uh, who knows, I would say it's two years ago, but it was probably four years ago, my, my friend Sheila was here. As I just think of her as I think of this. Her daughter, Cor or Morgan, was 19 and was killed by a drunk driver. And a lot of times at that point, you're going to seek justice. Her beautiful daughter, uh, Morgan, was killed. And, and Sheila went to court, and she went to court to argue a lesser sentence for the woman, Courtney, who, who, uh, who killed her daughter in a, in a car accident. Courtney went to jail for a few years, and Sheila visited her and fought for her and prayed for her, cheered for her as she, went, as she fought for sobriety. Now they're friends. They speak together, travel together, have fun together. That's amazing. Arguing for a longer sentence and more punishment for someone that did a, such a bad thing that took the life of your precious daughter. That's normal. That's human. We understand that. Jesus said, oh, it's so much more beautiful to know I've been forgiven. I need to forgive others. I'm going to fight uh, for, for, for the forgiveness of this person, the humanity of this person. Uh, that's what Sheila has done. And ev whenever I see it, I'm always amazed and always floored. And it is beautiful. It's the life that, that I want to live as well. Jesus said, when we actually love our enemies and live it out, this is what it's like to be the light of the world. It's extremely beautiful. And extremely difficult. It ends with these words, be perfect. It's written in the future tense. The emphasis is on an emphatic goal that is to shape our lives. Dave, I'm never going to get there. The more you know me, the more you know that, that I'm imperfect and I fall short. And, 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 and I don't do things right 100% of the time by any means. But the goal is, is to keep pushing that way. And it's not so much about trying harder. It's about knowing Jesus deeper. Christianity is not about have-tos, it's about want-tos. It's about wanting to represent Jesus. It's about wanting to love your enemies because you know that Christ died for me when I was against him and I was his enemy. This is what was done for me. So now I want to go and share the work to the world. There is good news. Home isn't that far away. Look at the light. Let's go towards that light. Christianity, it's always about want-tos, not about have-tos. It's not about trying harder. It's about knowing the shepherd better. The more you know someone, the more you, em you start emulating them. We just laughed the other day because we were looking at a, a, a dog owner that looked an awful lot like their dog. And, and it was, uh, you, that happens sometimes, right? And it seems, it seems like that happens. And, uh, and, uh, and it's like, yeah, it's just it's that idea. Like the, the closer you are to someone, you just, you just end up looking like them. And, and, so, and so that's what it's about with Jesus. It's about pursuing and becoming so close uh, to Christ, that you look like him, that you act like him. And Jesus said, in these six areas, here's what it's like to look like me and act like me, to emulate me. It's challenging. As a church, I pray, as a pastor, I pray that we can actually live it out, that people might find their way home. Let's pray together. Lord God, your words are, are, are so challenging thank you, first of all, for your forgiveness, to know that so often we fall short of what's laid out in Matthew 5, and we come to you and say, forgive me, wash me whiter than snow, create in me a, a pure heart, a clean heart. God, we thank you that, um, that you are a God who is patient, who is rich in mercy. God, in, in our life, as we deal with anger and, and, and our marriages and, and sexuality and, and oaths and promises and, 
enemies and injustice, that you would, you would help us to know our identity is really deep. Nothing can separate us from your love. We are a beloved child of God. So you can insult me, and it's not going to rattle me. I'm just going to keep loving you. God, help us, to, help us to do that. Help us to truly be uh, the light of the world. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. and sing some more praise songs with us.
Danny for the benediction. Courtney, whose addiction took the life of my friend Morgan, thanks for the light that Sheila gave to her. She's now sober. She's a Christ follower. Her marriage survived. She volunteers in her church. She's active. The light of the world changes the world. Let's go and be that light this week. Let's say these words as we go to live out our faith. It's extremely difficult, but it's extremely beautiful. God be with you as you go to live it out. May we seek God with everything we are. May we be known by our love and service. May we remember that come what may, nothing will separate us from the love of God. Go in peace, my friends.